Well, what, what clay printing it, um, produces is a monotype, a monoprint. That means an individual, you only get one. But you can get kind of a series. So these were both pulled from the same basic um, slab. But um, I believe this one was done first. Then in between, I added more of the white. So you can kind of see the progression, the, the difference. <coughs> now I did add something in between. You don't have to, but you'll still get two different prints. Sometimes they're very similar, but they're still going to be different. They're not going to be exactly the same. So, um, and I'll kind of show you how I got there. Okay, the, the, that's the finished product. It's on fabric. We're not firing anything, and it's not, the finished product doesn't look like ceramic, but it is clay. And it's not on canvas. Well, it's on a polyester, it's, it's a canvas weight, but it's a, it's a spun polyester. I did not invent this process, uh, but I did learn it from the man who did invent the process. And he was in art school, and he was taking ceramics, which is always down in the basement, right? And printmaking, which is always on the top floor. And he was going back and forth between the, the two mediums. And as you know, certain um, colorants, particularly red iron oxide, will, if you're rolling it flat, because you're working on a slab to start with, um, that color is gonna transfer to, to the paper. So he was rolling something flat because the way he makes his pots is he starts with a slab, decorates it, turns it into a, a cylinder, and then throws a top and bottom. And the, the, you know, a lot of those colors transferred to the newsprint he was using. And he looks at it and he says, oh my god, that's a print. So it, it evolved from there, experimenting with different substrates and different pigments and different clays and etc. So this is where we are, and that was about 50 years ago. So the first thing I start with is um, a quarter inch uh, slab, whatever, <laughs> one of those things, um, which I put in this board. It's a exterior plywood, and I have a little frame around it, which is hard to see now, of um, screen door molding, which um, holds the clay in place. And then I let it get leather hard. Then I start building up layers. Every layer has to get leather hard before I add the next, otherwise they're going to run together, bleed together. <clears throat> the more layers you have, the better the print is going to be, or potentially the better the print is going to be. So this particular um, board slab has um, already a lot of layers on it, because I've been working on it. This is my demo slab. So every time I go do a demo, it gets more. But in this case, I have coated it with um, a solid color. As you can see, the little white is testing to see if my slip was the right consistency. But um, so I've covered up a lot of what's under there. However, you can see how much is under there. I don't know if you can see from there, but there's it's sort of like, um, here, I'll pass a little bit of around. I need to put it back, otherwise I'm going to have a big hole, but pass that around. And I don't know if you can see this way, too, probably not because of the shadow, but you can see that I work down through the layers and there's color and color and color. I have not gotten back down to the base clay, which is a, a raku, um, sculpture raku white stoneware but um, I don't want a dent so I'm going to put this back in there but I'm flipping it over so that now these layers are going to be what I see on the surface it has to be rolled as flat as possible this I know you can get these here now but for a long time the only place you could get them was uh, cooking supply it's a pizza roller here it's a clay roller but it's a pizza roller Okay, so 
Um, the other thing you need to do, but besides waiting for it to get leather hard, maybe you can see those layers better now. Um, um, is it has to be flat. Not like a sheet of glass, but no big dents or holes, which I've got right there. We'll figure it out somehow. Okay, so I've got all that stuff under there, but how am I going to make something that looks like that or, you know, something interesting? And by the way, I always, I'm an abstract artist. Even when I try to do something realistic, unless I'm in a figure drawing class, I can do that, but it, it uh, evolves, thank you, into something abstract. But I do have students who have done more representational. It's, it's um, not really precise, because it's not a precise medium. But using stencils and masks and that kind of thing and drawing on it, you can get some representational. Oh, let's mix a color. What color do we want? Pigments, what do I use? I use Potter's pigments. Mason stains give me a pretty pale. Um, unless you lose a lot, use a lot. But you can use the, all the oxides. And of course, you know how to mix oxide, you know, dry into wet, wear a mask, all that good stuff. And you get some really nice, strong colors. As a matter of fact, this black has some black iron oxide in it. Since it's not going to be fired, the color you see is the color you're going to get, which is kind of nice. You know where you are. So, so you can use Potter's pigments. This aqua color is um, water-based ink, they call it, for printmaking. It's basically pigment, water, and I think a deflocculant. Um, maybe not even that. If you were going to make a traditional print, you would add some binder or something to make it thicker or all kinds of things. But if you do that for this, it won't work. So, so these are made specifically for printmaking and they work very nicely. You can also go to the um, paint store. For instance, if you go in, you decide you want your bathroom wall to be seafoam green. And they go in and they punch in all the numbers and they put in a little bit of pigment and end up with seafoam green. That's what these are, the basic pigment. And you can now buy them. Not, I'm not sure if you can get them from everybody, but um, when Mitch started, he would take his own jars in and say, can I have a little of your pigment? And they would give it to him or sell it to him, though I'm not sure. So these work as well. Um, those are the three basic ones I use. <clears throat> you can use um, powdered tempera. Again, make sure it's just the tempera, not anything added to it. And um, it doesn't always give a, a nice strong color, but it works as well. So I'm going to mix the green. So um, I usually start with a slip that's on the thicker side because some of these colors make it, must have a lot of defloc defloculant because they make the, the slip very thin. And if it's too thin, then it's not going to be very effective. Um, and you can always add more water if it gets thick. Very scientific. <laughs> Feel free to ask questions anytime. Any kind of stuff? Any kind of plate? I, well, you, for the base you want something, <clears throat> I use a stoneware with, with sander grog because um, it doesn't c expand and contract as much as um, low fire clays. And, and with the grog also, it helps it. And I use a white, white stoneware. Uh, normally that's not really an issue because you're going to add layers to it. <clears throat> The slip, you want a really nice white china clay. So you don't want to use EPK because it's gray. Um, I use either tile number six or English Grolig, which are both a nice bright white slip. Okay, so I already got a spot there. It's Oh, this is thin. All right, let's see what this does. Why not, right? Now I have to wait for it to get leather hard before I do anything. 
So one of the things you can do while you're waiting, I may put this in front of the fan. So I have a stack of newspaper, so it's absorbent. I have a clean sheet of newsprint because it's less distracting to me. Um, but you can use regular newspaper. And I'm going to put this down there. Now the, the newsprint underneath is going to help absorb the water and dry this out. <coughs> I'm sorry? You can use a blow dryer. It doesn't, a, a fan is about the same and you don't want to get your slab too dry um, because then it's going to crack and then the other thing about it is you want your slab to be equally leather hard throughout. If it's leather hard on the top but the next layer down is drier, you're going to lift off a whole bunch of that, the leather hard and leave the dry behind and, it's, and you don't want thick clay on the, on the print. So um, it's better not to, but I am going to put this in front of the fan. This color is Kelly Moore Venetian Red. I really like it. I think you can see why. Okay, so yeah, that green, how did that green get so thin? I probably ended up making my slip too thin. If it's too thin, it's not going to transfer. This is going to be a transfer. Now the, the slab is already yellow, so I want it to be a different shade, just... You can mix and match any of those pigments. You can mix the um, oxides with this stuff, with that stuff, it doesn't matter. Never going to fire it, so you've got a lot of leeway. The other nice thing is that... Um, Ooh, nice. <coughs> and I did make my slip too thin. It was too thin, so I made it thicker. It was too thick, so I made it thinner. I'm going to just put some more slip. Yeah, I know, you're not supposed to make more slip out of slip. You're supposed to start with, right? You probably know that if you spritz water, it makes the, the little particulates wet and they drop, so you don't breathe them. Yeah. Oh well. It's a demo, you know? Sometimes it goes perfectly and sometimes it doesn't. It's like when I, when I start pulling a print or when I'm getting ready to. It's like, you know, sometimes you get a demo print and sometimes you get a <coughs> demo print. So. <laughs> Of course, you're adding all this color to white, so it's not going to be that bright. I scrounge stuff from the hardware store, from the you know onions in the bag, from the grocery store, um, things from the kitchen. So scrounging is good. Some of this green is going to mush because that's a very technical term, by the way. You need to write that down. <laughs> because it's uh, still pretty wet. Ah, we can deal with that. Okay. Now I want that really flat. I never forget where my roller is though. The roller and the spritz bottle are your basic tools apart from the slab itself. Because it doesn't, it's not only used to prepare the image, but it's also your printing press, which you will see later. Okay. I get stencils from Michael's and places online, and I love numbers. I don't know why. Um, and I don't necessarily need them to be legible, so I can use them backwards or forwards. However, if I want them to be the normal look, like, you know, one, two, three, four, five, I have to do the mirror image down here, because we're going to take the top off of this. You notice there's clay on there? I rarely really clean up, because any of that that gets on here is just going to add more interest to what I've got. Um, and that's yellow. Oh, this is blue. Maybe we'll do it this way around.
I want it really flat in there because if it's not totally adhered when I put slip on top of it it'll scoot underneath and I won't get the the bit I want. This one's actually lumpy because it's um, if I let it go too long between working times it starts to dry out but of course you all know that you can reconstitute it and it I don't care if it's lumpy you know there are no rules for this process if it's lumpy when I roll it flat I'm just going to get a little bit thicker bit of color in that spot and difference in in thickness is one of the things that makes the next print interesting because what you're doing when you pull the first print is you're taking that top layer off when you um, pull the next print you're taking the next layer off and if it's thicker then that particular spot of color is going to still print pretty much as it did the first time if it's thin, most of it will be gone already. Ooh, there's a nice lump. This is from a laundry basket that started to fall apart. <laughs> the thicker it is, the harder it is to get it adhered. Some of them will, some of them won't. I mix with the brushes and then I leave the brush in there. There's no point in washing the brush off in between and uh, then having to use all that water and waste all that slip down the drain. You know that's really thin. And I want it to dry faster. So I have chalk or pastel or whatever you want to call it. When I'm running low on a particular color or when I know I'm going to want that color as chalk, I pour a bunch on newsprint, big stack of newsprint, come back next day, turn it over, put dry newsprint of it until I get it soft enough, oh, dry enough so I can make a ball out of it, then I let it dry completely. So this is that. Exactly that. Just dry. Nutmeg grater. Now this tends to make a pretty thin layer. So again, I want this to be leather hard. Lose the sheen. So then I can work it and because I already have a big bunch of this, I'm going to be more um, circumspect. How's that for a word? I could just roll it down flat like that. I could draw on it. Or I could use my favorite tool. Pastry, you know, for, for marking the top of your pie dough. I don't know where I got this. I think it must have been some kind of secondhand store. I don't remember. I've had it for a long time, but I guard it. It's important. That's what's left behind, and I hate wasting anything. So I'm going to save that and probably put it somewhere else. But in the meantime, that's what I got. And it's not perfect. Some of that, it depends on how dry that is. Um, but you can see I've got the, the lines just as they are from the, from the roller. But some of it was soft enough so I it kept some of the stuff in between as well. Another thing I like about this process, and when I was in a potter in my past life, one of my past lives. Um, I love things like Raku because you didn't know what you were going to get. So I like this because I don't know what I'm going to get. Dry, damn you. Uh, questions? So you don't use the heat gun because it's too... It'll just dry up the whole slab and you may run into layers being 
dry. Um, usually, I do other things in between. And one of the nice things about this is that I can go have lunch. I just cover it with a piece, if it's damp, I cover it with a piece of newsprint and then plastic and go have lunch. And then I can come back and it's the same thing when I'm pulling a print. Oh, I'm tired, I, you know, I'm really hungry. Just cover it with plastic, go back, you can come back and as long as you don't lift the print that you're making off the top. When you're finished making this print, are you then going to put a uniform color over this? I don't usually. Um, sometimes I do. It depends on what's left on the slab. I did it, I always do it for a demo so that you can see it from the, from the base up. Um, but there's a, there's a lot of stuff under there. There's actually a, a potential print that I covered up. But um, it's another thing. Sometimes the thickness of, of the slip on top means that you could actually pull a whole bunch of prints that still look good. But I usually don't make more than three, just because it's enough. <laughs> I want to move on. And as it gets farther down, the um, solidity, the, the even smoothness of the color starts to break down and it starts looking like little pixels of color. Um, I actually was in a show once and it was the reception and I was walking around and I heard there was a young man explaining some of the art to a, a few, a, you know, a small group of people. And he was standing in front of mine and he said, now this is digital art. This is made by a computer. And I said, <coughs> no, it's not. I um, thought that was an interesting assumption on his part. I suppose sometimes it looks like that. All right, we're going to call that virtually done. Another way you can um, speed the drying process is very gently, because that's wet, very gently, um, a feather touch where it's wet to try to get the paper to absorb some of that. doesn't look like much. Now the other nice thing about this is you do something you don't like, you just cover it up. The thicker plastic really likes to stick. This is from the, um, one of those baskets at the nursery that has all, you know, all the individual plants. And there was a whole stack of them. And I went and I said, what are you going to do with those? Oh, I'm going to throw them away. Can I have a few? This is obviously a sieve. It's actually from the dollar store. It gives me a finer. Oh, wrong way. Now the dry is helping the the dry is helping the wet get dry. But I need the dry to be leather hard as well. I don't want it to stay dry. So um, where it's on the already leather hard bit, I will spritz it with a little bit of water. Now this, I have to admit, is not, I didn't make this, it's, um, they call it colored paper chalk. It's made for kids. But it's really nice and soft. So it grates easily. Plastic. 
plants, leaves, as long as they're green, I can use those to, um, as stencils. Anything you can think of that's not going to crumble. Studio working slab is three foot by four foot. And you can print the whole thing or you can print a square inch. So I can work on one end and then go work on the other end. Oh yes, um, she asked if I ever carve into the slab. And um, I gave her a look like, yes, <laughs> that's coming next. <laughs> it's just it's so wet, it's taking forever. Um, so what I'm basically doing is, uh, do you know what a Dagwood sandwich is? You know, it's basically a, a club sandwich on steroids. Um, basically, I'm building a Dagwood sandwich. So the bottom layer is a piece of bread. And we're make, using homemade French bread, so it's kind of holy, you know, it, air pockets. So that's the bottom. And then I put some mayonnaise and some mustard and some shredded lettuce and some ham and a little more mustard, another piece of bread, and build it up and build it up and build it up. So the top layer is that holy piece of bread again. When I pull the first print, the, the, what I'm going to get in the print is mostly bread. But there's a little bit of mustard and a little shredded lettuce and maybe a little ketchup showing through the hole. So I'll get a touch of that as well. And then I'll peel that off. So now there's not so much bread left so I can see the shredded turkey and more of the ketchup. So the next print is going to have more of that on it. And I just can work back down through that sandwich, through all the layers as much as I want. Uh, or, which is what I do, you know, until I don't find it interesting anymore. And then I, I will um, put slip on top of it. Sometimes I just go for more pattern. Sometimes I will, this part I really like, so I might um, cover a whole bunch of stuff around it, but save that bit. Um, so there's, there's lots of options there. Don't waste anything. Use both pieces. So you can see that I put this on there to try to dry it out a little bit more. And there was quite a bit of clay on there. So when I flipped it over to put some dry newspaper on here, I just left that on there too and I just rolled that in as well. So I'm going to get some of this color over here. Unfortunately, with plastic stencils, if I wanted to go down and transfer that here, most of it's not going to transfer. It sticks to the, sten to the stencil. When it gets dry, then it'll crack off, and I'll you know, make it moist again, and then it, it will transfer, but otherwise not. And you can see the numbers. I do, as a matter of fact. Doilies, you have to use the chalk because if you roll it in, all those little, they're machine cut and they're, you know, there's all these little, so you have to be careful with that. But I do have a stack of doilies at home. I also have some lace. Um, Mitch gave a workshop. It was really a hardship. It was going to be a two week workshop, which is, you know, a lot of work. And we had to travel for it. You know, we had to go to this little tiny island in Greece. It was just, <laughs> and um, before we went out to the island, we went through one of the markets in Athens, and there was a whole area about the size of this where everybody was selling lace. And we're going around and saying, "Oh, this is so great! This is so great! Oh, it's handmade! It's handmade!" Is you know, you know, we're trying to negotiate the price, and oh, there's a whole set. And if they knew what we were going to do with that lace, <laughs> they would not have sold it to us. So yeah, we'll do, we'll do this. I don't want it dead center.
Now make it fairly thin coat so it'll dry a little faster. If you have anything left, if you don't take your stencils off, um, when you start printing, you're going to get white. It, the, sometimes if the clay is really thick on top of it, you'll get some of that transferring. But um, mostly you'll get white and then you go, oh yeah, I forgot that. Or you've, you've dropped a, or if you're working outside, which my summer workshops do, um, the tree drops stuff on it and you don't see it and you get this little white spot. What is that? Um, you probably all did something like this in school. I thought I had a pair of scissors here, but I like tearing anyway. I like the way it looks. If I do this on paper, instead of directly on here, and I let them get leather hard, then I can transfer this, and then I have the negative of it, which I can also use, which is kind of cool. The thing about these is some of them, depending on the color, come with a little steel ball inside to help you shake them, but otherwise they just... Oh boy, is that ugly. I should have showed you the super ugly first, but it's not quite as bad now that I took the lace off. and make everything flat. Because the uh, stencil had a little thickness, they're now the, the, where the numbers are left behind are a little bit lower surf on the surface. But a little below the surface. Ear syringe, otherwise known as a slip trailer. I can do this directly on the slab, but um, then I really would have to go have a lunch break. I love dots. And circles and squares. Somehow those show up a lot. Now I'm doing this sort of randomly because I can cut them up and use whatever bit I want wherever I want it. Black iron oxide makes a really good black. I sometimes add some blue to it to give it a little more, not just black, black. Um, depending, you know, I might add a couple of other colors. I also, the aqua color also makes a black, but in order to get a really solid black, because I'm adding it to white, I need a lot of that. So um, the oxide is better. So can do this this way. It doesn't slide away. It's a very fine mesh so the effect is subtle and some of it will disappear as I roll it flat because the lines are narrow but some of it will stay. I can use all of this bit or I can put it back in the groove the way I did that one over there or not.
I'm making little dots out of this so it's going to be kind of a multicolored and it probably won't be really round but just for fun now I gotta roll that flat and now I've made grooves if I leave them as grooves I'll, the print will have white lines this would also be a good opportunity to fill those grooves with some solid thick color and then those lines would show up print after print after print people ask me if you can use the pigment straight straight on, on here as a print as rather than mixing it with clay the thing is that when you print it's the clay that is transferring not just the color so if there's no clay in it it won't print I have been told by a physicist I am NOT a scientist by any means um, that it has to do with the shape of the molecules of the clay and of the polyester that they're like velcro and they bond to each other but pure pigment doesn't do that and if you wanted to print again the clay doesn't adhere to the clay the same way and it either won't transfer at all or it'll crack off this is um, a piece of a hair pick Now those are, that's a really narrow line, so some of it's going to get lost, it'll be subtle. Here's my sort of square. Got to do something to this to make it printable, because we're getting to that time. Okay, now the stuff that I tore the holes in is really pretty fragile when it's wet. So instead of trying to peel it off the paper and put it down, I do it the other way around. I put it down and peel the other paper off the back. And let's cover up some of this ugly. You see, I've got those spots. I don't know if you can see them that I can also use to print. And once again, the newspaper, because I want to keep this clean and dry. And the other part of the paper being fragile at this point is that it often leaves stuff behind. And then I have to get out the needle tool and pick the pieces out. And it was a little wet, so there's some mush. This one, I admit, is a total plagiarized from Mitch Lyons. Can you see what it is? It's Cheerios. Now these I'm not going to roll in. And I'm not going to lift this up for you to see the Cheerios, but there are Cheerios on there, believe me. But I am going to use the, the chalk. And I'm going to spritz it because I just put all that dry on there and I don't want it to come off. I sometimes use those little, looks like a little plus sign um, that uh, the tile spacers. Okay, I just got the word. We've got 10 minutes so I'm going to Put the black on and then we're going to print.
Cheerios. There's circles and dots. I love it. Okay, so I'm just selecting, I'm basically selecting what's leather hard <laughs> that I'm going to put on there. Circles and dots. Lines and dots. Maybe I'll see what that looks like before I... It really makes things pop. And this came out to be a really nice little shape, so I want to put it somewhere. Somewhere. Who knows? All right, now I'm going to get ready to print. So first I'm going to spritz the whole thing and roll it flat again. And I see that one of those carved lines has pretty much disappeared, so I'm going to do a quick, not too thick, Okay, now the next step is to decide what I want to print. Because I can print the whole thing, or I can select the part that I like the best and make a smaller print. So, for two reasons. One, I'm not happy with the whole board, and two, time, I'm going to make a smaller print. Now I use another esoteric product, drywall tape, from the hardware store. I'm going to do something with that has this black in it. I don't know if I can get some of those numbers in it too. <coughs> this will give me a nice clean edge and if I'm really careful, nice square corners, but we will approximate. That's what uh, mats are for for prints. You can mat it down, you know, picture mat. <clears throat> well, maybe I won't make it too small. All right, by definition that is a perfect print, or it's going to be a perfect print. Now this is a fabric I print on. It's, um, if you've ever done any sewing and using interfacing, there's a non-woven interfacing. And this is the, what I use is made for the filtration industry, but it's essentially industrial weight interfacing. This is very not square, but. So I'm masking off the part I'm not going to print so that I don't get, um, th the trade name is Rime, so I don't get the Rime wet, um, stained on the edges. So I spritz the surface of that, and I spritz the surface of this, and it's both sides are the same, it doesn't matter which side I use. And then 
Um, I was going to tell you all about traditional printmaking so you'd know the differences, but in traditional printmaking, this is going to go through a press, and the minute you touch it, you can't move the paper anymore. But this, you can move it around until it's centered. And traditional printmaking, you run it through the press and you have a print. <coughs> But this is a case of needing to coax the clay off the surface and onto the rime. So it's a lot of back and forth. A little bit of spritzing on both surfaces. I'm sorry? Why can't you just make a canvas out of the interfacing? You can. You can print on, on the interfacing. The um, reason I like this better, it's much heavier, it's sturdier, and I like the surface texture. And the, the final look of the print is a little more crisp. But I have printed on the, on the in regular interfacing. You absolutely can. That way you don't have to go to the manufacturer and order a 30 yard roll, 40 inches wide. You can also print on some printmaker's papers. Again, the, I don't care, personally, I don't care for the look of the print. It's much more um, kind of faded, and the printmaker's paper tends to pick up the pigment rather than the clay, so it's a thinner print. And you have big issues because paper loves water. It's hydrophiliac. Uh, I love that word. So when it gets wet, it expands. So every time you pick it up to re-wet it, um, it, uh, it expands. And when you put it back down, you lose registration. So it's, it's pretty tricky. It can be done. Now I'm checking. It's almost there, but I'm checking. There must be a little dent there because I've got a little spot that hasn't printed there. And it looks like a little bit in the middle. And I want to be careful not to overdo this because once you've transferred and if you keep spritzing, you run into the danger of liquefying the surface and um, then you get more mush. I do have to be careful not to let the whole thing pop up because then I would lose registration and that would not be good. Now to get the edges, because believe it or not, even as thin as this is, it's, it's a little step function up off the off the slab. So in order to get into the edges I use a spoon raided from the kitchen to uh, sort of burnish the edges. The other thing I have to be careful about is not letting the uh, the drywall tape get too wet because again that'll make the edges um, dirty and sometimes and then as the last thing I'm going to flatten the whole thing out all, all over again. I love that reaction. Thank you.